When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, show them no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. But thus you shall do to them. You shall tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, hew down their asherim, and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God. The faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations and those who love him and keep his commandments, but repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. Then it shall come about because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them and the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness which he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine and your oil, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. There will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. The Lord will remove from you all sickness and he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you have known. But he will lay them on all who hate you. You shall consume all the peoples whom the Lord your God will deliver to you. Your eyes shall not pity them nor shall you serve their gods for that would be a snare to you. If you should say in your heart these nations are greater than I. How can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord God will send the hornet against them until those who are left and hide themselves from you perish. You shall not dread them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and an awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away, away these nations before you, little by little. You will not be able to put an end to them quickly, for the wild beasts would grow too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them before you, and will throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. He will deliver their kings into your hands, so that you will make their name perish from under heaven. No man will be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them. The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you will be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. You shall not bring an abomination into your house, and like it come under the ban. You shall utterly detest it, and you shall utterly abhor it, for it is something banned. Whew! It's a lot of verses. And you may be sitting there going, yeah. So we're going to take the next few minutes and talk about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you give us, Lord. And God, we have, we have prayed for rain. And you have blessed over and over again. And Lord, we're praying that you sprinkle our hearts, Lord, with the freshness of your word this morning. 
may you reveal to us things that we need to know that will make us better servants of yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, a few weeks back, I was on Oahu uh, with a bunch of the wrestlers from Molokai High School. We were there for the state wrestling tournament. And uh, so the Saturday that we were there, that particular weekend, we went out to eat after the state finals. We went to the old spaghetti factory. Uh, if you've ever been there before. I had never been there before. But um, we went there. It was a special occasion. Six of our wrestlers had meddled in state. And so we were celebrating. This was a special occasion. But, but, but I want you to appreciate the scene here. Okay? I've got Molokai kids in a real restaurant. <laughs> this is not Jack in the Box. This is not Burger King. This is not even Pizza Cafe. There is atmosphere in this place and there's carpet on the floor. I mean, it's a, it's a real restaurant. Uh, in fact, I had to um, encourage one of our kids not to crawl under the table to get to the other side. <laughs> so I think maybe you're kind of getting the picture here a little bit. Well, the servers came by and they handed us the menus, and, and they're pretty big menus. There's, there's quite a lot of choice in there. Again, something that we're not all that familiar with. And, and like many restaurants, uh, everything's kind of in sections. You know, you've got your soups, salads, appetizers, and then you have your entrees, you know, the main uh, dish that you're going to get for your food. And, and, and above that entree list, in smaller print, it tells you what comes with the entree, you know, you, it'll say something like, uh, you know, with your choice comes garlic bread and salad or soup and, you know, dessert, something like that. And so, you know, we're looking through the menus and everybody's trying to figure out what they want, what their selection's going to be. And so finally everybody gets it together. And so the server comes by, and as the server's going by to each one and taking their order, he's also asking them what they would like to drink with their meal. And uh, so they're going down the line, and he comes to one of our girls sitting not too far from me, and he gets her order, what she wants to eat, and then he asks her what she wants to drink. And then she kind of has this kind of, strange look on her face and she kind of looks one way and then the other and then she looks up at the guy and she goes, is it free? <laughs> now, based on the server's response, I almost wonder if he's dealt with Molokai kids before. <laughs> because he seemed to know exactly what she meant. She didn't really mean, was it free? And his answer was this, yes, a drink comes with your meal. And I thought, wow, you're good, buddy. <laughs> and that's really what she meant. She didn't mean, was it free? She meant, in the meal that I got, is there a drink that's included with that? In the package deal that I get with this meal, in that package, do I get a drink with that? That's really what she was wondering. Because see, the bottom line is she wanted to make sure that she was getting everything she was supposed to get and what she ordered and she didn't want to have to pay any extra for something that she should have already gotten. Which makes sense and we're all there. We want to know what's included with what we're supposed to get. What is part of the deal? What is part of the package? And there's nothing wrong with that. The th thing that's wrong is, is when we don't get what's supposed to be included in the package, right? Then we, then we get a little upset. Or, or even what's worse than that is that we don't know what's supposed to be in the package and then we miss out on it, right? Did you realize that when, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you said yes to the Lord, when you said yes, I believe that you died for me and that's my only hope of salvation, do you realize that, that you got a package deal? There was a bunch of things in that whole deal when you said yes to him. It's, it's not just about salvation from hell sometime in the future. That is true and that's great. And if that's all there is, that's a pretty good deal. But there's so much more involved in that. 
And the sad thing is, so many times as followers of Christ, we miss out on everything that God has for us because we, we don't realize what He has for us. And the children of Israel were a great picture of, of a people that were given a package by God because they were chosen by Him to be their peop, His people. And, and He wanted to make sure that they got all that he had for them. And we see that kind of encapsulated in this chapter, chapter 7. And, and that's what kind of stuck out to me as I was going through this the other day. See, the Israelites, they've been slaves in Egypt, if you remember the story, if you've been watching the Bible on uh, the History Channel. The, the, uh, the Egyptians had made them slaves for 400 years they had been slaves. God raised up Moses. Moses came along as God's vessel to bring them into freedom and to get them ready to go into the promised land, the land that he had promised them. And, and before they went in, they were in this area called the wilderness. Just desert is really what it was. And while they were there, God was preparing them to go into the land. They weren't ready yet. He had to give them some instructions and prepare them so that they would be ready to go in. And his instructions were for their good so that they would be able to experience everything he wanted them to. That they would be able to get all of the package that he had for them. And we see this in, in places like uh, Deuteronomy 6.24. It says this, The Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes or instructions um, for our good always and for our survival. In Deuteronomy 10, we see the same thing. that he's given. He said, I give you these commands and statutes, these instructions that I'm commanding you today. Listen, for your good. God wasn't giving these instructions to, to just, you know, say, hey, I'm God, you're not, and I want to show you how big and bad I am. No. God had a relationship with these people, and he, he was giving them instructions so that when they went into the land, they would be able to experience everything he had for them. He wanted the best for them. He wanted them to have the best. See, he knew that a society where adultery is just something that you can just do whenever you want, and it's no big deal, he knew that eventually that society would kill itself, would destroy itself. He knew that if people were allowed to just murder each other, that eventually society is going to go downhill. He knew that if people stole whenever they wanted to steal, that things were going to go bad. And the only thing that they had, the only way that they had to verify that is to look at the people that were living in the land they were going to go into. These people were bad news. If you study the history of the seven uh, nations that we just read there in verse 1, they were bad. They were, they were murderous. They were immoral. They were some of the most immoral people uh, in the world at that time. Uh, they used uh, sexual uh, prostitution as a form of worship to their gods. They sacrificed children to their gods. I mean, these were bad people. And God was saying, look, I want to give you instruction because I have something good for you. I, I'm not trying to hold anything away from you. I want good for you. I want you to experience all that I have for you. When you buy a car, there's an owner's manual in that car somewhere. And in that car, and if you look in that owner's manual, and you come to the place where it talks about fuel, it'll say something like, um, use only octane 87 or higher in your car, right? Or it'll say something like, unleaded fuel only. Don't put any other kind of fuel. Well, you can look at that and you can go, ah, pfft. I think these guys are just trying to kill my fun. Because I want to put rocket fuel in my car. Because I think I can go from west end to east end in 30 minutes. And I want to put rocket fuel in. I think these guys are just trying... No, but if you stop and think about it, that's, that's just the opposite of what they want. They want you to experience that car to its fullest. Because once you get to a point where you want to get another car, they want you to consider getting their brand a car again. So the instructions that they give are so that you have the best experience possible in that vehicle so that one day you'll go, you know what? I want to buy that same kind of car again. 
Their instructions in that book are not to kill your fun. They are to give you the best for the package that you bought. And it's the same way with God and His people. God was not trying to keep them from something. He was trying to provide them with the greatest experience they could have in the new land and in the new life that He was bringing them to. And that was the, that was the whole point of spending time in the wilderness, getting these instructions, getting prepared. God was preparing them for something great. And He had already begun to prepare the land, the new life for them. In fact, it, it's so amazing. If you go back to chapter 6, he says this to him in verse 10. It'll come about that the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he'll bring you to great and splendid cities which you didn't build. Houses full of good things which you didn't fill. And hewn cisterns which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you didn't plant. And you will eat and be satisfied. What was he saying? He's saying, look, I use the bad guys... To prepare this place for you. You're going to get cities that you didn't have to build. You're going to get houses that are full of stuff already in the, on the shelves that you didn't have to build or stock. You're going to get wells full of water that you never had to dig. You're going to get vineyards and olives. You're going to have all the stuff that you need that you didn't have to plant or do anything for. I've already got it prepared for you. You see what God was doing for him? He was saying, look, I've got a new life for you. I've brought you from slavery. I've brought you to a new land and a new life. And I want you to experience it to the fullest. So listen to my instructions. Because I want you to get all that I have for you. What was the package that God had for him? Well, as I go through this chapter, I, I summarized it in three things as I saw it in here. And I just want to quickly point that out to you. He tells them, first of all, if you look at your notes, he said that he would be their partner. He said he was going to be their partner. The definition of a partner is somebody who's involved in activity with somebody else. Somebody who's involved in activity with somebody else. Look what it says there in verse 2. He says, and when the Lord your God delivers them before you, talking about these seven nations, and you defeat them, you shall utterly destroy them. There's, there's an unequal partnership going on here. Do you see it? God says, listen, I'm going to deliver these nations to you, and then your job is to destroy them. I'm going to do my part, then it's your job to do your part. I'm going to partner with you in this deal. And of course God's the bigger partner. Because he even says at the end of uh, ver uh, verse 1 there. He says these seven nations are much greater than you. Yeah, the odds are already off, right? Seven to one. So they were going to need a big God. But God said, I'm going to deliver them to you. And then you will destroy them. It's a beautiful partnership going on here. Totally unequal. Of course God's the big part of the deal. But, but somehow in God's... God's economy, he wanted to partner with his people. Kind of reminds me of Batman and Robin. I, I'm not a real big Batman, you know, I, I remember reading it as a kid, but I never understood the whole Robin thing. <laughs> Batman did not need Robin. I mean, he was the guy that was always getting himself in trouble, and Batman had to bail him out. Um, I, I, I always, that always kind of puzzled me. It was like, Batman, ditch this guy. He's not any help to you. I mean, Batman was the guy that had all the cool gadgets, you know. He could do all the cool stuff. Robin was just kind of the guy that, you know, followed behind him, holding on to his cape. That's kind of the picture here. God didn't need Israel. God didn't need the Israelite people to do anything. But he desired to partner with them. And he said, look, when I bring you into this new land, in this new life, part of the deal, part of the package is, we're going to be partners. I don't know about you, but it sounds like a pretty good partner. So it sounds like a pretty good deal for Israel, right? Second thing he tells them is this. Not only would he be their partner, he would be their provider. In verse 13, he says, I will love you and bless you and multiply you. Also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your herd, the young of your flock, and the land which I swore to your forefathers. You shall be blessed above all 
people. I'm going to provide for you, Israel. You're my people. I'm going to provide for you. I, I'm not only going to partner with you, but in this partnership, it's a really cool deal for you because I'm also going to provide all that you need. That's what he's telling them. In this new land, in this new life, taking you out of slavery, slavery I'm going to provide for you. You need to know that. That's part of the package. That's part of what I'm providing for you. And then the third thing, in part of the package, he says this. I'm going to be your protector. In verse 17, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I just possess them? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. What did he do to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt? Well, you saw the show a few weeks ago when the, the, the Israelites came out of uh, Egypt and Pharaoh changed his mind and he decided to chase them down and all of a sudden they found themselves with the Red Sea in front of them and all of Pharaoh's army behind them, no place to go to the left or to the right, they were stuck. And what did God do? Not only did he deliver them but he wiped out the entire Egyptian army. And so God said, look, when you look at these people, and it's going to be a 7 one to 1 odds, they're big and they're bad and they're mean. And when you look at them, you're going to freak out a little bit. But when you do, remember me. Remember what I've done for you already. I've protected you to this point. I will continue to take care of you. I will be your protector. See, the flow here is really beautiful because when you have him for your partner, he's going to be your provider. And as you have him for a partner and he's your provider, he's going to protect you all the way through is what he was saying. So God says, hey, let me tell you what this package is I have for you, Israel. Here's the package. I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to provide for you. And I'm going to protect you. Can you get any better than that? I mean, what a sweet deal. What a, what a great opportunity for the people to get this package from God. And as I was looking at this, folks, I realized there's a great parallel here. We are not Israel, for those of us who are followers of Christ. We're not Jewish, but we are God's people. When we come into a relationship with Him, we become His kids, His children. We're king's kids. And with that relationship, there's a package involved, believe it or not. And it parallels exactly what we see here in chapter 7. God says, hey, I want to partner with you. Yeah, I know you're nothing. I know you're kind of weak and wimpy. But that's why I want to partner with you. God gets a kick out of using you and I. I, I don't get it. He doesn't need us. But he chooses and desires to partner with us. Some of you in your Bible study this past week on Tuesday nights up in Mauna Loa, you were in uh, John 15. And the promise there to, to those who are followers, you are in the, the vine, right? And without him, it says you can do nothing. The, 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 the branch must remain in the vine because without him, you can't do anything. God, it doesn't say that about God. It doesn't say that God looks and says, without you, I, I can't do anything. I need you people so that I can get done with. No. God looks at us and says, hey, you know what? Without me, you're nothing. And we go, yeah, God, you're right. If we're smart. But God pulls us into this relationship. He says, you are my child. Guess what? You, I want to partner with. And in the process of partnering with you, guess what? I'm going to provide for you in amazing ways. I'm going to provide for you spiritually, first of all, but then in all kinds of other ways as well. And then, and then... I'm going to protect you. If you will stay hooked up with me, lined up with me, following me, guess what? You're going to be under my protection spiritually. So there's a great parallel here. So, the thing I wanted to know as I'm looking through there is, okay, how do I get all of that package that I have coming to me? I mean, if a drink's part of the deal here, I want the drink included. Is it free? Is it part of the package? And so as I looked at this, I came up with four reads. Not, 
not a nickname for my daughter, four Re's, R-E's, that God wants us to do in order to get everything that we got. You could call them four keys if you want to. I just thought that the re may stick better with you and here's the first one. The first one is reject. Reject all resident sin. Reject all resident sin. In verses 1 and 2, God says, look, I'm going to bring you into this land. And when I bring you in, there's going to be these seven nations. And he lists them here. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Seven who are stronger than you. This, these guys are big and bad and they are badder and bigger than you are. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you, verse 2, and you defeat them. This is not an if. It's a promise. You shall utterly destroy them. Don't make a covenant with them. And don't show any favor to them. You jump down to verse 5. But thus you shall do to them. You shall tear down their altars. Smash their sacred pillars. Hew down their ashram, which were the uh, 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 fertility goddess pole. And burn their graven images with fire. Do you get the picture here? God says... I don't want one speck of these idolatrous, immoral, heathen people left among you. I have pulled you out of an idolatrous nation and a, and a, and a, a life of slavery and I want you to go into a life of freedom and get everything I have for you. And so what that means is all the resident sin needs to go. The sin that's residing there, you need to get rid of it. See, what happens, folks, is many times in our lives, God calls us into this relationship. We get His package. We get to be His people. But we hold on to some stuff that we know is just going to cause us problems in the long run. Habits. Relationships. Secret sins. And God says, no, no, no. Get rid of it. But God, this one isn't so bad. This is, you know, it's not such a big deal. I know it's sin, but nobody knows I'm doing it. And, and really, it's only bad if it causes other people to stumble, right? God says, no, get, get it out of your life. Do you realize? See, what he was saying here is, these folks are worshiping other gods. They are going after other, other things than me. Do you realize any sin that we, that we hold on to and harbor in our lives becomes our God? We want that more than we want a relationship with Him. God says, get rid of it. Now, what we discover later on as you read more of the Old Testament... They, the Israelites didn't get rid of all these people. And it happened just like God said later on in this chapter, in chapter 7, He says, if you don't get rid of them, they're going to be a snare to you. And that's exactly what happened. They became a huge problem for Israel. You come to Christ and you're all excited and you go, man, this is great. I never knew I could have my sin forgiven. I got a relationship with God. I mean, this is fantastic. And you're excited for a while, but there's some things that God begins to point out in your life and He says, I want you to get rid of this. I want you to utterly get this out of your life. And maybe you ignore it or maybe you just, well, later, God. And, and what God is telling you is get rid of it now and get rid of it all because later on, it may not be a problem right now, but later on it's going to come back and it's going to haunt you. If you went to the doctor and he gave you a checkup and the doctor came back and said, hey, I got some bad news for you. You got cancer. I mean, that would be devastating. I don't know about you, but if I was sitting in that situation and the doctor said, you got cancer, my next question would be, what can we do? And if the doctor said, well, listen, this is what we can do. We can go in, we can operate on you, and we can, we can cut it out. And we can get that out of your system and then you should be okay. I'm saying, sign me up when we start cutting. Right? Get it out of there. 
I'm not going to say, well, Doc, you know, I've been thinking. Just take out 95% of it. Leave 5%. I just like it to hang on. For, I just, I don't, you know, I kind of enjoy having this tumor on my side. And I don't want to lose it all. We've kind of become close. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to say, get it out of me. I want it out. Why? Because you know that thing is going to grow and, and, and continue to cause destruction in your body and eventually kill you. So you say, God, or doctor, get it out. God says, look, there is sin in your life. There is a spiritual cancer growing in your life. You need to destroy it, get it out, turn your back on it, stop it totally. If you want all that I have for you, if you want this package, if you want to enjoy it to its full, this new life that I have for you in this new land, man, you've got to get rid of the resident sin that's there. Now here's the fun thing, if you look at it close. It's not something that we do on our own. Remember the partnership. He said, look, Israel, I'm going to deliver these guys to you, and then you destroy them. There's a partnership going on here. And it's the same in your life and my life. God says, look, I'm going to point out the sin and together we're going to get rid of this deal. It's not just you going, okay, I'm going to just build myself up. I'm not going to do this anymore because some of you know how incredibly uh, frustrating that is when you fail over and over and over again because in your own strength you can't do it, right? But God says, hey, I'm going to partner with you in this deal. I'm not just pointing it out to you and just saying, you take care of it. We're partners. And remember, it's a Batman Robin kind of deal. He's a whole lot bigger and a whole lot better. And I just have to trust him in the process. And as he gives me tools, and many times he will, to take care of these situations in my life, I'll grab the tools and say, okay, here we go. Too many times, though, we sit on our hands and we go, I don't know why God's not taking this away from me. You know, I've, I've, I've talked with people that deal with, with uh, lust. People that deal with situations where they're, where they're sexually promiscuous. Man, I don't understand why God just won't take away this, this lust from me. Well, first of all, let's, let's get things clear. Sexual desire is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. It's a God-given thing. That's not the bad thing. The bad thing is when we use that sexual desire in a wrong way. So, you're having a problem using it in the wrong way. Has God pointed out to you places that you shouldn't be where that temptation is even stronger? Has God pointed out to you things that you're watching or consuming with your eyes and ears that help to feed that kind of lust? What do you mean God's not just going to take it away and I can still do those things and not have those desires? Hey, God's going to say, hey, here it is and here's the tools you need to use in your life to destroy this utterly. Get to work. If you want to enjoy the complete package, you can't continue to look at pornography and you can't continue to look at movies where people are involved in illicit relationships and expect that those desires are going to be abated. It's going to work. God's going to point those things out and say these things are the altars and the ashram and the religious evil things that need to go. And they, you don't need to hold on to them anymore. Get rid of them. And I will partner with you to overcome this area of sin in your life because I want you to experience the best in the land and the best that I have in this new life for you. That makes sense? So he says reject it. Don't hold on to it. Get rid of it. And I want you to notice too before we step out of this point there's a warning concerning the next generation. Look what he says in verse 3. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. For look, they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. You hold on to these things and you continue to coddle these things among you and let them reside among you, then what's going to happen is you may resist it pretty well, but your kids coming up behind you are not going to be able to and they're going to get sucked into it and they're going to end up serving other gods and turning their back on me. God says, I'm warning you, it's not just about you, it's about the next generation to come. And folks, can we not see how that's so true in, in where we are today? And I'm not talking about the world. See, the world doesn't know any better. 
The definition of a sinner is they sin. Right? So they don't know how to be righteous. They don't have Christ in their heart. So I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about people that say they're followers of Christ, that hold on to some of these things, and then they wonder why their kids go down the tube. And God says, look, don't let this stuff reside among you. It may not trip you up right now, but beware, it will get your kids. The next generation is at stake. Well, I can handle this. I can do this. Can your kids? So the first one is reject all resonant sin. You want to experience the full package that God has in this new life that He's called you to. Reject that resonant sin. Number two, here's your second re. Rehearse often who you are. Rehearse often who you are. God tells him as he's going through this, verse 6, you are a holy people to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His own possession. That literally means, and maybe your translation points this out, to be a special treasure. That's what the Hebrew word means there, His own possession. A special treasure. And of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set His love on you or choose you because you're more in number than any of the peoples, for you're the fewest. But because the Lord your God loved you, he kept his oath that he swore to his forefathers. He brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's saying, look, don't forget who you are. You are a chosen people. You say, yeah, but, but, but that, was, that was Israel. That's not us. No, no, no. We talked about this when we talked about grace. There's an aspect of grace where God chooses to dump that grace on you. It, it talks in the New Testament. Remember we looked at it in 1 Peter about being adopted? Adoption is something you choose to adopt someone. God set His love on you. He said, you are my child. The problem is we, we forget who we are and we live out the identity of who we're not. The story's told about some prairie chickens that found an egg and they they came across this egg and so the mama prairie chicken decided that she was going to sit on the egg and take care of the egg and so she did she sat on the egg she warmed the egg she took care of the egg and one day the egg hatched and out of the egg came a baby eagle not a prairie chicken but an eagle but the prairie chickens raised the baby eagle like a prairie chicken. They taught it how to get seeds on the ground. They showed it this, their favorite dump where they would go and rummage through the trash and get food. And this baby eagle even began to mimic the sound of the prairie chickens. One day when they were rummaging through the dump and looking for food, this little eagle that thought it was a prairie chicken heard a noise and looked up in the sky and saw this big bird just floating. He said to one of his prairie chicken brothers, What is that? And the prairie chicken brother said, That's an eagle. But you can stop looking at it. You're nothing but a prairie chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and so the little eagle went back, rummaging through the rubbish, making prairie chicken noises and continued to live like a prairie chicken even though he could soar like an eagle. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a child of the King. You are an eagle. Stop living like a prairie chicken. <laughs> know who you are. Amen? Amen. And sometimes... We forget, don't we? we? We get out in the world and we get tainted by the world and we get sucked into stuff and we forget, no, wait a minute. I'm a child of the King. I'm a chosen one. I have a better... He's given me a new life out of slavery in a new land and to live in a new way. I'm supposed to soar, not rummage in the dump. 
And so God says, hey, listen, I've got this package for you, a new land, a new life. And part of the deal is you're going to be able to experience all that I have for you as you rehearse who you are, regularly remind yourself you're a child of the king. Live that way. Don't live any less than where I've placed you and what I've called you in. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. Man, if you don't have these verses marked in your Bible, stick them on a, stick them on a card, stick it in your, in your car, post it on your refrigerator, tape it to your wife's forehead, whatever you need to do to see this on a regular basis. 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in your behavior. Because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We go to chapter 2 and verse 9. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people. Here it is, for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You were the have-nots, and now you are the haves. You were the graceless, and now you are the graced. Amen? Amen. So rehearse often who you are to take full advantage of the package deal that God has for you. Number three, remember the key to blessing. The key to blessing. Verse 12, then it shall come about because you listen to these judgments and keep them and do them that the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which we, he swore to your forefathers. And then he goes on and he talks about the blessing. What was he saying? Listen, follow my instructions and you will experience the blessing of life that I have for you. There are consequences for doing right as well as doing wrong. In the New Testament, we call it the, the, the um, principle of sowing and reaping. Right? You, you don't plant pumpkin seed and expect to get a banana plant. I hope. <laughs> you don't plant tomatoes and expect to get mangoes. What you plant, you're going to get back, right? God says, listen, I made you. I know how you function best. Here's my instructions. Line up under me. Let me be Lord in your life. Follow my plan. It's for your good. It's not about God being an egomaniac. It's for our good. And he says, as you follow these things, the consequence to that, oh, you'll be blessed. You will just be blessed. That makes sense. So he says, man, you want the package that I have for you as you step into this new life then you've got to remember the key to blessing. And the key to blessing is simply obedience. It's obedience. And then lastly, number four. Remind yourself that God is worth trusting. He's worth trusting. Verse 17. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I. How can I just possess them? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh in Egypt. God is worth trusting. He's big. He's large and in charge. He's worth putting your trust in. And you've got to remind yourself of that. And sometimes the way you remind yourself of that is to look back at what he's already done in your life. And he's promised them, look, I'm worth Trusting. Would you put this down for that first bullet point? His presence is with you. In verse 21 he tells them, You shall not dread them, for the Lord your God is in your midst. What was he saying? I'm with you. My presence is with you. When I'm with you, everything's going to be fine. Because I'm going to take care of it. My presence is what you need. I'm worth trusting. You put this down for the second point. Not only is his presence with you, his power is awesome. 
You shall not dread them. Verse 21, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and an awesome God. His power is awesome. Not only is His presence with you, but His power is awesome. And we forget that. Now, perhaps this last thing that I'm going to share with you may be one of the most important things that you hear today. His presence is with you and His power is awesome. But would you put this down? His plan is always best. Amen. Now, now let me show you something that maybe you didn't see as we were reading through this. Verse 22 says this, The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you. Listen, little by little. Hmm. Wow, wait a minute, God. I, I want them out now. I want this stuff gone now. I don't want little by little. No, take it out like chunk by chunk. Get it out. What's this little by little stuff? God, there's seven nations. They're big. They're bad. They're powerful. We need them out. Just do it now. Just wipe them out. Get them gone. Get them out of here. God says, no, this is the way we're going to do it. This is the way I'm going to do it with you. Let me do it little by little. Why, Lord? And he tells them why. You'll not be able to put an end to them quickly for the wild beasts will grow in too numerous for you. Depending on your translation, what he's saying here is this. You wipe these people out, you're not going to be able to fill the spaces in the, in the country and so wild animals are going to come in and they're going to be a problem for you. They're going to grow up in this situation. They're going to cause you, Israel, they're going to cause you all kinds of problems. So, you can't handle it right now if I take all of this out of your life. All of this out of your land. So I'm only going to take it little by little. We're going to do this together. And as you can handle it, I'll take out more and more. You say, how can that possibly be helpful? Because what happens is this. God already warned him in chapter 6. When you go in and when this happens, I'm going to give you uh, uh, cities that you never built. I'm going to give you houses that are stocked that you never built or stocked. I'm going to give you wells you never dug, that whole thing. And then at the end of that verse, he says, and when you get all that stuff, do not forget the God who brought you out. See, what happens is sometimes... When, when God takes all the trial and the struggle and then the junk out of your life, somehow you think, you got it together. I got this Christian thing down, man. This is not, what, what's your problem? I quit this and I don't do this anymore and I don't have a problem with this. There, there is an aspect, folks, that if we're not careful... Even as God helps us, we somehow think that we did it, that partnership deal, and then we become self-reliant. See, if Batman always came in and he took care of everything for Robin, never let him go out and date, then Robin sit back and think, I'm an amazing superhero. I should have my own comic book. In fact, I should have my own series of movies. And it should say, Robin and Batman. And see, the point of the matter is that God sometimes allows those things to take place in our life because He knows, if I wipe this out right now, you can't handle. And the wild animals are going to come in and they're going to cause havoc because you're not ready. So God told Israel, He said, listen, listen, we're going to do this thing. Here's the package, Israel. We're going to partner up. I'm going to be the most amazing partner you ever had. I brought you out of slavery. We're going to be an amazing uh, duo, you and me. But here's the deal. As we go through this thing, I'm going to provide for you. As you line up and follow me, I'm going to provide for you as we partner up. And I'm going to protect you through this whole deal. But we're going to do it in my plan and my way. And it's going to be little by little, step by step. And you've got to trust that my way, my plan, is always the best, even though you don't understand it all the time. 
And as long as Israel hung there, God said, this is what you got. Here's the package. It's yours. Enjoy. I want you to enjoy this new life to its fullest. God says to you and me as followers of Christ, I got this package for you, man. I want to partner with you. I want to provide for you. I want to protect you. I've got some awesome blessing for you. Keep lined up under me. Follow me. Know that my plan is the best. I'm going to be with you. My presence is there. My power is there. And just keep believing that my plan is always best. Even though it doesn't always make sense to you and you won't get it. It's always best. Trust me. I'm worth trusting. So as you go through Deuteronomy 7, it's just not about a history of Israel. It's about looking in a mirror. And seeing that God's got some awesome things for you and I as children of God. But if you're sitting here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then none of that that I talked about this morning is true for you. You, you, are, you are on the outside of what God wants to give you. But you're not his child yet. The Bible makes it very clear in John chapter 1. In verse 14 it says. For as many as received him, Jesus. To them he gave the right to become the children of God. You become a child of God when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you decide his way is the right way. I want to follow him. And if that's something this morning that you have never done, you've never received him, you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to encourage you this morning. His invitation is open to you. He wants you to be a part of his forever family. Would you bow your heads please and close your eyes.